Welcome to the City Cares Small Business Academy, presented by City Trends and the law firm of Cy Farth Shaw. In this six episode series, we explore what it takes to start a successful business designing or manufacturing products for retail sale. Welcome to the third session in the 2021 City Cares Small Business Academy. Full disclosure, how to legally describe your goods to consumers. Our presenters today are Tanya Esposito and Josh Salinas of the law firm Seifarth Shaw. Hello everyone and thanks for joining us for City Care Small Business Academy, session number three. Full disclosure, how to legally describe your goods to consumers. My name is Tanya Esposito and I'm a partner in the Washington office and I'm joined by Josh Salinas, who's an associate in our uh, Los Angeles Century City office. Um, we're so glad that you are joining us for our session today. So why are we here today? Um, we're here today because as many of you likely already know, our society is really quite litigious and small companies really have to be keenly aware of the risks that they face when putting a message out onto the market about a particular product. If that message can be viewed by an average consumer as false or misleading, um, or even by a competitor or a consumer watchdog group or uh, a government agency or regulator. And so the purpose of today's discussion is certainly not to scare you or uh, to sort of put you in a state of shock, but more so to just talk about the reality of the real costs of a lawsuit, which is really more than the money paid in legal fees or any damages that might be awarded by a court. Um, it's really something that would require you to take time and energy away from moving your business forward and uh, focusing on what's most important for, for those purposes. Um, you're likely to be involved in lots of document discovery and exchanges of information um, that can be an incredible waste of time, money, and resources. And so hopefully if you keep in mind some of the information we're going to share with you today, you can avoid any and all of that. Um, also, we want to talk a little bit about negative publicity that comes from the false advertising or consumer deception lawsuits. Those can also lead to um, a negative perception of your small business or your entity by the public. And so we certainly help you avoid that. So with all that said, let's go ahead and get started. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's our agenda for today. We're gonna start off by talking about the legal landscape and the rules and the laws that apply in this area that you'll wanna keep in mind. We're gonna talk uh, a little bit about advertising law basics. We're also gonna cover some hot topics and those include all of those that you see here. So pricing and discount, and disclosures or signage, uh, use of the made in the USA and source or origin claims. There are lots of unregulated buzzwords that we're gonna cover today, many of which I'm sure you're very familiar with. We're gonna talk about the Telephone Consumer Protection Act or TCPA. We're gonna talk about can spam, and we're also gonna talk a little bit about influencers. And then we'll end our discussion with a recap of all the issues we covered today. Next slide, please. So we're gonna start off with the legal landscape and we can move right ahead to that next slide. Yes, thank you. So it's important to understand that the legal landscape here really has three prongs, um, innovation, competition, and consumer protection being sort of the focal points of this legal landscape. And so, Innovation comes into play in terms of the intellectual property laws. And so the founding fathers thought copyright and patent rights were important to protect because they're in the constitution, right? And so that's how we get to our intellectual property laws, which help protect what can very well be the core or the essence of your business. Um, and that is directly related to competition, right? And so unfair competition law, which is really at the core 
uh, of a lot of the consumer litigation and consumer enforcement actions that we see in this space. Both the federal government and most states have laws that prohibit unfair competition and unfair business acts or practices. And that includes the way companies label, market, sell, and advertise those products. And we're gonna talk a little bit more specifically about that as we move on with our conversation today. Um, but it's important to address our third prong here, which is consumer protection. And so federal and state laws exist to protect consumers from misleading information disseminated from companies. And so that's how uh, you know we see lots of enforcement and regulatory actions come into play um, as part of that third prong of, prong of consumer protection. The majority, however, of what we're gonna talk about today is gonna to fall into consumer protection and unfair competition as opposed to intellectual property, but we thought it was important to make sure that we present it to you in the most uh, wholesome fashion so that you could see how all three of those interplay. Let's move to the next slide, please. So the litigation in this space, where does it come from? There's a couple of important sources um, where we know litigation or enforcement actions come into play here. So it could be an individual consumer that has a specific gripe with a company for a particular claim or a particular product in terms of the way it was advertised or marketed versus what they perceived uh, that product to actually provide um, to them as the consumer. Um, the second group is a group of individuals or consumers, and that's called a class action. So if you've got a number of consumers who are similarly situated because they all have claims that are based on the same set of facts or circumstances related to a particular product. They will often form what's called uh, a class and pursue litigation as class members. Um, you're also subject to litigation by competitors or competing small businesses or companies who may sell products similar to yours who may take issue with one or more um, factors associated with the way you're advertising or selling a particular product. And finally, and perhaps the most important is the government. So as mentioned previously, we have federal, state and local uh, regulatory bodies or enforcement agencies that are looking at the way companies are marketing and advertising products to the public. And those types of matters um, can start with a simple inquiry, um, asking for information about a particular product from a company um, and can you know, escalate all the way to uh, an enforcement matter that could potentially result in you not being able to sell your products any longer or having to uh, cease doing business. And so as a litigator in this space, I've seen um, every sort of variation of these types of government actions against small and large companies alike. So um, very important to be aware of where you have exposure and to take the appropriate measures to prevent uh, any unnecessary exposure in terms of the way you're marketing or advertising any of the products you're selling. Uh, next slide, please. So it's important to talk a little bit about the primary federal regulator, which is the Federal Trade Commission. And so the Federal Trade Commission uh, is the primary federal regulator that regulates marketing and advertising to consumers. And so what specifically they're looking for in the most general terms is any unfair or deceptive acts or practices. And they're focused uh, mostly on what the average consumer takes away from a particular um, piece of marketing or advertising as it relates to um, a particular product. And so um, the FTC is, you know, a political body that changes with every administration and commissioners are appointed and um, that of, of course changes with you know every presidential administration we're now at a point where we've just had that change and we've got new commissioners seated but 
Um, suffice it to say that the commission as it exists currently has already expressed a very dedicated approach to aggressive uh, enforcement actions as it relates to consumer protection issues. And so um, you can sort of juxtapose that against prior administrations where perhaps the commission may not have been as um, aggressive or proactive, I should say, uh, regarding some of the same issues relating to consumers. But I encourage everyone who's listening today to check out the FTC's website. It really is a great resource for marketing and any related questions you may have about what you can and can't do. Um, they also have a fantastic guide against deceptive pricing and um, you know how you can use, for example, the word free or similar representations. Um, all of that is, you know, sort of nicely summarized and pretty easy to comprehend. And so, um, if you've not yet familiarized yourself with the FTC's website, I would very much encourage anyone here listening and, and you know, sort of really um, interested in these issues to take to take a look at those and to actually subscribe to some of the. Uh, posts that they put out, which I find to be incredibly helpful um, for anyone who's selling consumer products. Um, and also important to note is the use of disclosures under FTC guidance. And so, you know, one thing, in addition to substantiating any claims that you're making, you certainly want to disclose things that are of importance to consumers. If there's a factor um, in your marketing or advertising that is influential for purposes of a consumer making a decision about whether or not to buy that product. And there's some information that, you know, would be key for a consumer to know prior to making that decision, then you should disclose it. One example is, you know, the use of influencers. If you're using influencers for, uh, to help market or sell your products and those influencers are compensated, it's important that you um, notify your consumers of the same. And we're going to talk about influencers as we move forward, but that's just one example. So to wrap on this slide, the, the real important takeaway is to be aware of the Federal Trade Commission, to familiarize yourself with the website, take a look at some of these guides we've highlighted here, and periodically take a look at, you know, what, what publications the commission is putting out, because they're all very, very helpful. Uh, next slide, please. So now we're going to talk a little bit about advertising law um, and the basics of advertising law. And so essentially, in order to comply with the laws that um, you know, are applied at the federal letter level, but also at the state level, you want to make sure that all of your claims associated with those advertising are true and not misleading. You want to make sure that any claims you're making are substantiated, meaning if you're saying a particular thing about a product that you're selling, you should be able to point to something that proves that that thing is true, whether it be you know, science, testing, anything like that, you need to have some form of substantiation to make that particular claim. And then qualifiers, disclaimers, and disclosures have to be clear and prominently displayed. Um, so this is just an example here, 100% accurate satisfaction guaranteed and it's free. Well, that's a really big and bold statement to make, obviously. And so we're using it as an example and, um, in jest here. But if you look at the asterisk, we've disclosed and disclaimed everything you need to know about that statement. And that is nothing in this life is free. So <laughs> you'll often see in a number of marketing and advertising campaigns, that there may be one, two, three, or four asterisks next to um, prominently displayed statements providing appropriate disclosures and similar to this. And that's very, very important for purposes of making sure that while you're making an advertising claim about a product, you're also disclosing to the consumer what are some additional factors they would want to consider or have knowledge of prior to making any decision to buy that product. Um, let's move to the next slide, please. So here, the second part of that equation is it has to be true. And so what does that mean? True. 
it means that every reasonable interpretation of an advertising has to be true and not misleading. And so if you're um, saying something that's truthful, but it's not necessarily as clear as it should be, um, or it comes across as a half truth or a technical truth, but still has you know, the likelihood to mislead a consumer or the average consumer, then it's not truthful. Um, so that means that even if you didn't mean for the ad to be interpreted one way, and if it's reasonable to do so, um, then it could potentially be misleading. And so here's an example. The advertiser um, could say that, you know, a certain product was um, meant to um, potentially, you know, brighten your day. And um, there's really no way to sort of substantiate that. And one consumer could consider that claim to be um, applicable to, you know, their skin. Oh, this is going to brighten my skin, right? Well, another consumer could certainly perceive that to be something that was going to affect their mental health. Well, those are two reasonable interpretations of the same claim. Neither one, I would argue, is uh, necessarily <laughs> um, one that I would use or be able to substantiate in any way. And so um, the bottom line to take away from the example that I gave is that if there are more than one interpretation of a particular claim, you have to think of all of them before you endeavor to use a particular um, you know, uh, claim or statement about a product, because that's the way the law expects you to um, formulate marketing and advertising campaigns. And that's certainly the way that the FTC and state regulators will look at claims that you're making. They will look at them as if they are stepping into the shoes of the reasonable consumer. And if there is a basis to understand a statement or a claim about a a product in one way or another, and it's not clearly disclosed or disclaimed, um, meaning the advertisement doesn't include all of the sort of asterisks and disclosures that are necessary to clarify for the reasonable consumer what the product is, what its intent, you know, what it's intended for, whether there are any prohibited uses of the product, those types of um, key pieces of information are really required and necessary in order to ensure that um, any claims or statements you're making in connection with that particular product are truthful. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Um, and so let's move on to the next slide, please. And so if it's not true, what is it? Well, it's also important to understand that an ad is deceptive if it's not truthful, not substantiated, not provable, or true, but still misleading. And consumers will rely on the ad when making their decisions to purchase. So, as I've just explained um, previously, you know, if an ad is deemed deceptive, that means it's not truthful, it's not substantiating, uh, substantiated and or misleading, and it's likely to influence the purchasing decision of a reasonable consumer acting reasonably under the circumstances. So the bottom line is that it's false. And does the reasonable consumer care? Well, just because it may be proved um, at the end of the day that a consumer didn't care, it doesn't mean that the lawsuit, suit, any lawsuit that could be filed here won't go on for a long time to prove um, you know, that in fact it is false or, or it is deceptive in some way. And so um, one example, you know, of the types of claims that have fallen into the category of um, deceptive and have resulted in litigation in both the state and federal level, level is use of the word or label natural, made with natural ingredients, as you see here on the slide. Um, it could be reasonable to interpret that natural means 100%, and if not, um, then it can be truth. It can be true and misleading. And so, instead, you could say something like contains natural cinnamon or contains, you know, natural orange essence or something like that. So, to further sort of tease out 
what aspect of the product is really natural is a way in which you could both use a phrase like natural, but also give the appropriate disclosures or disclaimers around use of that phrase so that the consumer understands that it's not 100% of the product that you're claiming to be natural, but rather um, one ingredient within that product, or maybe it's multiple ingredients within that product. But the point here that I'm making is that if you use a phrase like natural, where there could be more than one interpretation, you certainly want to be clear about what, you know, what aspects of the product it actually applies to, as opposed to suggesting wholesale um, that it, you know, applies to the entire product, which could be um, confusing to consumers and could certainly result in unnecessary litigation and potentially even enforcement actions. And it already has in, in a couple of instances that I'm aware of. Um, let's move to the next slide. So we've already talked a little bit about um, what is truth, what is deceptive, it also has to be substantiated. So an advertiser has to have a reasonable basis for express claims and all implied claims in all advertising. And so the amount of the amount of substantiation or the type of substantiation required actually depends on the type of claim and the context of the claim and whether the claim is qualified. So, um, you know, th these are all very specific considerations and considerations that I would encourage you to, um, you know, think about and invest some time in prior to actually launching any kind of a marketing initiative or advertising initiative. Oftentimes, um, you know, I'll work with clients who have already committed to a particular marketing or advertising campaign. Um, only to find out that, you know, it's not sort of presented to me for review or someone on my team to take a look at. And there are issues with some of the claims that are made because there's just an inability to substantiate, you know, what, what the client wants to say. And so um, I just think that it's really, really important to be clear that, you know, it really behooves you to run those types of materials through your lawyer either internally or externally um, to make sure that you're not running afoul of what's going to be required of you from a regulatory perspective. And certainly, you know, from the private bar, from private litigants who um, will look to see if whatever claims you're making can actually be proven and whether there's substantiation to be making those claims. Um, let's move to the next slide, please. And so here, we're talking about disclaimers. So any disclaimer that you put on a product, which is obviously something you want to do if it's appropriate, it has to be clear and prominent, regardless of whether it's electronic, um, on a piece of paper, perhaps it's um, you know a television ad, but in any one of those media, it has to be clear and prominent. And so. What does that mean from a regulatory perspective? It means that you should um, make sure that the font is legible, um, that it's contrasting. So perhaps it's you know a uh, different size, different shape, perhaps even a different color. Um, if it's in a piece of paper, you want to make sure that it's sort of above the fold or in a place where you know that a consumer is likely to to read and not stuck in the bottom at a footnote somewhere that's just going to get lost in the mix of uh, a consumer reading that particular piece of advertising. You don't want any mice type or super small type that is just impossible to read even for someone who's wearing glasses like I am. Um, you know, no auctioneer speak, right? So if you've got a radio ad and you've got someone speaking so fast when they're providing um, a disclaimer that you can barely understand what they're saying, that's not effective. And that's certainly not something that a regulator is gonna look at and, and think, um, think fondly of. It's likely to be you know, criticized. Um, and if it's on a TV ad, you want that disclaimer to be visible for long enough so that it can actually be read by the human eye. So it shouldn't just, flash across the screen and then um, 
you know, it's, it's impossible to read, it's impossible to comprehend, and it's pretty much pointless um, for purposes of shielding you from any kind of uh, risk exposure um, if a regulator, you know, were to sort of inquire about that particular piece of advertising. So the important point there is just to make sure that when you are disclaiming something in connection with your marketing or advertising of a product, it has to be clear and prominent um, in one of or all of these ways, depending on what your advertising is and, and where it's going to be seen by consumers. And I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to Josh. Uh, thanks, Tanya. Uh, next slide. So we're going to talk about um, the hot topics that we've seen um, regarding advertising um, and marketing law. So the first one is pricing and discounts. Um, pricing and discounts have their own consumer law uh, pitfalls, um, and there's somewhat of an, uh, a false sense of security when um, using disclosures for certain pricing for discounts for sales. And that, as China previously mentioned, you can have certain claims that may be more subjective, subject to interpretation. For example, um, how is somebody going to reason reasonably interpret um, a claim that something is going to brighten their day? Um, where, on the other hand, with pricing, um, you, you may have a claim that's a little bit more objective. It's more quantifiable, quantifiable because you know, this is the, the price of the item. This is you know, something that's measurable. It's more objective. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it, it's foolproof. And so the, the same basics, the same fundamentals we previously discussed about making sure it's truthful, it's not misleading, it's not deceptive, um, is also going to apply to um, any campaigns with, with pricing, discounts, uh, coupons, and other similar promotions. Uh, next slide. So one of the um, kind of emerging trends we've seen um, with regards to pricing um, has been this wave of lawsuits regarding comparison pricing. And so early on, these types of claims really targeted and hit hard the, um, the outlet stores. And there was generally two types of, of issues that um, they were alleging. One was that the, the pricing of the products, um, the, the price it was being compared to may not have been the actual true legitimate price. And to illustrate, um, the store may have a, a product and that price tag um, has two prices on it. The first um, is the, the sale price in which the consumer can purchase it at. And, you know, for example, that could be $20. And then adjacent to it or right above it, there would be a comparison price. And it may say something, for example, compare at or original price. And that would generally have a higher price. And so the consumer would have this expectation that they were getting a, a good deal because, you know, they, they could see the, the actual price, the actual discount compared to what they, you know, they would have paid before. Um, and so there were some claims that, you know, that original price, that compare out price um, was overly inflated. It was falsified and may, may have been a fictitious price just to try to convince the consumer that they were getting a, a better deal than they were. Um, the other issue um, with regards to this comparison pricing is that the underlying goods that were being compared um, may not have actually been um, the, the same or identical products. And so especially with the outlets, the allegations were that um, the, the store that was being sold or the uh, shirt that was being sold in that outlet store, um, you know, had that price, you know, it's $20 you can buy now compared to $100 at the other um, you know, the traditional uh, brick and mortar store. Um, but the, the allegations were that that, you know, that other, you know, higher priced um, item was actually of different quality. It was maybe had better materials and the outlet item actually had lower quality materials. So the comparison wasn't exactly the same because um, even though the, the, the prices were different, but actually it kind of inherently reflected the, the underlying value of the, the different quality in the products. Um, and so we saw coming from those outlets, just hundreds of lawsuits across the country going against these retailers who were using these types of comparison pricing. Um, there, there were concerns that, you know, it was deceptive, um, but part of it because it was so effective is, you know, the consumers did have this expectation that they were getting, getting a good deal. Um, but as we mentioned before, with, with these, the takeaway is you wanna make sure you're disclosing what you're comparing to, 
where they're being sold, for how much, um, this, the importance of disclosures is really important. Uh, next slide. And so on a, a similar note, um, kind of going to go over the issue of uh, MSRP or the manufacturer suggested retail price. Now, the MSRP is the price at which a manufacturer recommends to its vendors uh, to sell its product. Uh, the FTC has issued guidance that the manufacturer is free to suggest uh, to set that suggested retail price. Um, and the vendors are not actually required to use that um, MSRP. Um, but if the manufacturer does want to have some enforcement mechanisms, they can actually decide whether they want to continue uh, selling to those vendors who may not be on, uh, honoring or, or fully complying with comparison pricing to that MSRP. Um, and the FTC has an, issued an opinion on MSRP pricing. Uh, the FTC has acknowledged that when you have an MSRP and a, a vendor or another retailer selling it at a different price, um, it's okay to have those two comparisons because the MSRP and the sale price are actually substantially different prices. Um, but the FTC does acknowledge that it's rare to have um, you know, all the sales actually to be at the MSRP. Um, so the, the key issue is to make sure that that MSRP is not um, a fictitious price. It's not overly inflated to try to give a, a, a false sense of a better deal. And so you, you want to make sure that that MSRP, um, you know, that is going to be the average price um, that products are being sold, uh, the, the same uh, quantity and quality uh, in that same uh, geographic area or uh, or trade area uh, for a reasonable period of time, which is um, which is 30 days. Um, so the, the key thing is to make sure that that MSRP is not being um, overly inflated or fictitious, uh, just to try to convey a, a a false sense of a, a better deal. Uh, next slide. Now another popular promotion is uh, buy one get one. And there's two ways that this can be used. One is when the consumer is purchasing a product at full price, and then they receive uh, the, a second product um, essentially at no cost for free. Um, another way is when the consumer purchases one product at a regular price, and they receive a discount um, of another product um, for a discounted price. Um, and there's FCC guidance and also state regulations on these um, on these types of promotions. And the, the key thing is you have to make sure it's not deceptive. And so if you're offering a, a product that it's supposedly free or at no cost, it really actually does have to be free. So if you're selling a, a $5 widget and then offering another one for free, you can't you know, inflate the price to $10 and then you know, claim you're giving a free one because the net effect is really there's no, there's no free, there's no discount. Um, so you have to make sure that you know, it's not deceptive that the free items are actually free and you're not increasing one item just to offset the cost of the other items. Um, and the FTC has issued some uh, guidance on when using the words free. Um, you, you can use it, it can be proper, provided that the, um, the items are you know, actually provided as, as free or at cost. Um, but the FTC has advised that if you are gonna use these types of promotions, to really use extreme care, extreme caution um, to make sure that um, you're not engaging any deceptive practices. Uh, next slide. And so we briefly touched early on um, why, you know, why we're here, some of the concerns about um, litigation that may arise uh, from these uh, types of lawsuits. Um, so one uh, type of remedy we often see is monetary damages. Um, Restitution is what we've seen um, courts being uh, more creative in how they're going to make sure that consumers who have been offended, um, essentially those wrongs have been righted in. So any money that's paid out of pocket, um, they're going to receive those back. And um, with regards to those comparison pricing uh, lawsuits, uh, three common ways of restitution to kind of put the money back in the hands of consumers um, are listed here. Uh, one, um, when looking how much the the, uh, the offending company is going to have to pay, uh, is going to be looking at the full purchase price that was paid by each consumer for those um, uh, deceptive or misleading products. Uh, two is how much each consumer would have paid. Uh, so, example for example, if they did buy 
you know, a shirt that was listed at $20, but compared to a $100 shirt, um, how much would the consumer have actually paid if they did know that that $20 shirt actually really was worth uh, $20 and there wasn't a $100 comparison? Um, and then the last um, remedy we've seen with restitution is looking at how much the company actually profited from sales and then using that as a way to, um, to have the company pay that back. Um, civil penalties um, we've seen, especially with these comparison pricing cases, can really be significant. Um, we've seen attorney generals um, uh, penalize companies, and it's not uncommon to see these in uh, the seven-figure uh, amount range. Um, with an injunctive relief, um, this can uh, be some requirements that you actually have to change uh, your business practices, either stop any of these offending types of promotions or implement some type of new, uh, more compliant promotions and maybe have um, some type of uh, ongoing monitoring uh, and maintenance to make sure that everything's, um, everything's fair and, and uh, uh, not de deceptive. Uh, and then lastly, with a lot of these cases, with especially class actions, um, you can be susceptible to uh, attorney's fees and costs for the, uh, the plaintiff's attorney who brought the case. Uh, next slide. Um, so coupons are uh, frequently used and just going to briefly touch on them on what makes a good coupon. Um, if you're running a promotion or issuing coupons for public use, there's a, a couple key uh, uh, characteristics for a good coupon to implement. Uh, next, you can go through all five. Um, so make sure it's um, clearly and conspicuously displayed um, you know, what the product is, um, what the location is, um, any durations or termination dates. Uh, and then lastly, uh, exclusions. Uh, next slide. And so this is um, actually a, a horror story to briefly go over. There was a, a large retailer who offered uh, a coupon and the terms were that consumers could get $50 off a purchase of $100 and more. Uh, the only uh, condition was that the consumer had to use a certain brand credit card. Um, but one of the loopholes was that it actually did not exclude uh, the purchase of gift cards, and then there was also no limit on the number of purchases. Uh, so you had smart consumers who were aware of, of what they could use this coupon for, um, started buying uh, store uh, gift cards, online uh, gift cards, and you were able to essentially buy $100, $100 gift cards for half price. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, you can go to the next one. And so the, eventually the retailer had to backtrack and issue a correction, um, clearly uh, explaining what the issue um, was with the prior coupon and implementing some new terms that should have been there in the first place. For example, uh, they limited the deal to a singular regular priced item of $100 or more, um, set a, a, a termination date, um, but more importantly, they excluded gift cards from certain online stores. So, so the, the takeaway is that um, you know, it's important to make sure you're viewing, scrutinizing any of these coupons. Um, you know, apart from the issues with deceptive um, pricing, um, issues with, with discounts, um, actually having, um, you know, safe, secure um, coupons that don't have these potential loopholes um, are incredibly important. Uh, next slide. And so uh, another hot topic we've seen is with uh, source and origin claims, for example, made in the USA. And um, there's both some uh, federal and um, state guidance on this, at least with the FTC. Um, for most products, um, unless they're automobiles or certain items made uh, for certain textiles or wools, um, there's actually no requirement that manufacturers have to use either made in the USA or made in America disclaimers, labeled stamps. Um, but if the company does want to use any of those claims on their products, um, there are some certain requirements. And if you want to make those statements, um, you have to make sure that all or virtually all of the product has been made in America. And so in other words, all the significant parts, processing, labor that go into the product must be of US origin. Um, if there is any foreign content, um, it, it should be a negligible, really small amount. Um, the, the, the states have uh, their own um, state laws on um, the types of claims that can be made um, for, um, for example, made in the USA. Uh, California used to have the most 
strict, uh, strict requirements. Uh, within the last five to six years, they've, they've changed to become a little bit less strict and more compliant uh, or more closer to the FTC's, um, FTC's guidance. Um, but for um, California law, um, if you're gonna use a made in the USA claim, um, all the non-domestic parts cannot constitute more than 5% of the final wholesale value of the product. Um, and then there's also another exception is if um, one of the parts or components of that product cannot be um, sourced or obtained in the US, um, it can be um, you know, used from another, uh, another uh, country, um, but that part cannot constitute more than 10% of the final wholesale value. Okay, next slide. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tonya. Great, thanks so much, Josh. And so I thought it would be um, important to just go through some of the marketing and advertising buzzwords that we see quite frequently lately with consumer products. And those includes all the ones you see here. So sustainable, um, small, batch, batch crafted, handcrafted, artisan, handmade, local. Um, and so, you know, just because there really are no sort of regulated definitions associated with these uh, buzzwords or, you know, phrases that you may see on advertising and packaging doesn't mean that you don't still need to comply with all of the sort of rules and regulations that we've already spoke about here today. And so if you're claiming that something is sustainable, well, how is it sustainable, right? Disclose that on the packaging, add something um, about it in your advertising. It's organic. Is everything in it organic? Are there parts of it that are made for from non-organic products? Um, natural if it's 100 percent or not 100 percent natural as we've already talked about you know a consumer could perceive from your marketing or advertising that if you use the word natural on your packaging that the entire product is natural so the important thing to keep in mind here is that again while these terms may not be regulated by statutes or government agencies like the fda it really doesn't mean that they're foolproof and so it means that any claim that touts a feature characteristic of a product that a consumer might actually take into consideration and may ultimately pay a premium for when buying that product, for example, sustainable. It has to be true and it can't be misleading or else you expose yourself and you run the risk of you know, being involved in either an enforcement um, matter or any form of the litigation that we've previously discussed. And that could be directed by consumers, competitors, um, or both. And I will just tell you that there have been a number of litigations um, that have involved all of these marketing adver and advertising buzzwords. So, um, you know, while you might find some industry guidance out there that's helpful um, on either the FDA or the FTC's website, um, the fact of the matter is that these really are just largely um, undefined and, and therefore somewhat, you know, underregulated. So you want to make sure that as you're using these types of advertising buzz, buzzwords that you are doing your best to be as truthful and as accurate with your marketing and advertising and disclosing anything that you think may be of particular interest um, to a consumer when deciding to buy um, a product based on one of these buzzwords. Let's move to the next slide, please. I also wanted to touch briefly upon the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, or TCPA. And so the TCPA was enacted to protect the privacy interest of consumers, and it places restrictions on a couple of things. Um, it restricts calls and text messages to cell phones that belong to consumers, um, calls to residential telephones, and sending advertisements by facsimile, which is not a very common practice today, obviously, but um, was at one point, and so that's why it's part of this statute and is regulated by the TCPA. Um, the monetary exposure associated with TCPA violations, um, you know, can be devastating because it's $500 of statutory damages per violation, so that's per call, per text, or per facsimile, and up to $1,500 per call and possible treble dam damages for willful violations. However, there's no 
no cap rather on class damages. So the important thing to note here is that if you violate the TCPA um, and you know one or more consumers collectively form a class and that class is approved and you're able to move and, and that you know uh, class class is able to move forward with the litigation, you could potentially be facing a very um, devastating amount of, of damages in this type of litigation. So it's important here to make sure that to the extent you are engaging in uh, you know, calls on consumer cell phones or text messaging that you're getting affirmative consent um, from the owner of that phone number or facsimile number to the extent you're sending faxes um, you know, before you endeavor to communicate any form of marketing or advertising. Um, and let's move to the next slide, please. And again, the TCPA applies to cell phone calls, uh, text messaging platforms, certain text messaging platforms, ringless voicemails, landline calls, faxes, and of course, there's also vicarious liability to consider as well, which is again, costly, expensive, time consuming. And so the point really to take away from these two slides about the TCPA is that if you are engaging in this type of marketing and advertising, make sure you have uh, affirmative consent from a consumer who owns that particular phone number for, before you endeavor to engage. And I'm going to hand it back over to Josh now. Muted. Okay. I think I was muted. Um, so the Can Spam Act. Um, it, the real purpose is to protect against uh, protect consumers against uh, deceptive emails and um, to to the extent they do receive any of these unsolicited commercial emails, uh, they do have a way to to opt out and to stop receiving them. Um, so it was enacted to protect consumers from receiving unsolicited commercial emails. And there's a, a couple key requirements and restrictions. Um, the sender and header information has to be on all um, all uh, applicable emails. Um, there's certain requirements for the format and content of commercial emails. And then, as I mentioned, opt out mechanism procedures, uh, many of uh, which you may be familiar with. Um, for example, if you've received some of these types of emails, you'll often see at the bottom. Um, it may actually look for the little link where you can, can click to get um, to opt out and stop receiving them. Um, it's, it's another type of um, uh, the claim that can have really significant uh, monetary exposure and risk. Um, there's no private right of action under federal law, but um, the state attorney generals and then the FTC um, can bring separate actions and the, the penalties under these um, can be tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so it's really significant uh, per, per email violation. Um, and one, one new thing, we're not going to recover it today, but there's um, California has a new uh, privacy, a relatively new privacy of statute, uh, the CCPA. Um, that may provide a new alternative claim. Um, it doesn't necessarily cover the same stuff as Can Spam Act, but the underlying issues um, to the extent any companies are connect, uh, collecting uh, consumer information, for example, emails and houses are being used who they may be given to or sold um, can kind of trigger uh, some new sister claims under the CCPA. Uh, next slide. And so there's a wealth of issues um, with the Can Spam Act, but at least for, for today's presentation to kind of give an introductory overview, um, there's a, a couple key requirements to take away for uh, complying with the Spam Act for uh, uh, for emails that are subject to its requirements. Uh, one, uh, emails must contain accurate header and subject lines, and then the commercial emails must comply with the next three requirements, which is uh, identify itself as an advertisement. Uh, there must be a physical address, and then also, um, as I mentioned before, uh, provide the recipients a way to opt out of future messages. Uh, next slide. And so the, the last hot topic we're gonna cover is social media influencers. The FTC is really keen on undisclosed endorsements, um, especially those via social media. Uh, but the concern with um, these types of advertisements is is the deception. Um, you know, traditional um, uh, advertisements before uh, social media, um, it was kind of easy to to know when you were being um, you're being advertised to. Um, you saw traditional commercials, um, traditional print media, um, but then with social media, you had this 
kind of new new wave to effectively market and advertise products and you know even having just users who may not be you know a professional influencer who've made a career with you know hundreds of thousands of followers um, even just having a regular consumer um, you know reposting something retweeting something um, there is that somewhat more organic uh, promotion of a product um, and so the, the FTC was you know, really aware to make sure that there was no deceptive endorsements and that if somebody was promoting a product on social media, if they were receiving any types of compensation, um, that was being disclosed. And so the consumers weren't being deceived um, into thinking that that influencer's opinion, um, you know, didn't have any other um, external influence on it. Um, so the, the key takeaway from this is that if there's any material connection between the advertiser and the influencer, and if it's not obvious, it needs to be disclosed. And so that material connection can be something, for example, compensation or payment, um, but it can be something that's as simple as, you know, a discount code, um, you know, an entry into a, a sweepstakes, a free product, a, a coupon. And so if there's anything, any type of that consideration, any type of, you know, you know value that's being provided um, in those manners, um, you know, there, it needs to be disclosed. And so um, the actual good news is it's really relatively simple and easy to disclose that um, on social media. Um, you can use, you know, hashtags um, with key terms such as sponsored, sweepstakes, contest, um, even ad is sufficient. And it, it, it's nice to have that short, uh, short disclosure. Um, there's gonna be no um, immunity if you try to make a claim that you couldn't disclose um, the endorsement because there were technical limitations, for example, uh, a character limit on Twitter or or you couldn't post it, um, that's not going to suffice. You still have to make the disclosure. And so um, if there is any material connection, that needs to be disclosed uh, online. Uh, next slide. And so, you know, what's not effective? Um, using either deceptive or just unclear uh, disclosures, uh, for example, hashtags, instead of using, um, you know, sponsored, using a short and abbreviated SPON, um, you know, a thanks, or even having no disclosure at all. Um, if it's not going to, you know, fully disclose that endorsement, then it's, it's likely not going to be sufficient. And so an ad is going to be deceptive if it's promoting the benefits and attributes of a product. Um, but it's not readily identical as an ad. Um, and so that's that's one of the things to, to be aware of. Um, you know, is the consumer able to understand, you know, that this is an ad um, when they're seeing uh, their favorite movie star or athlete, you know, on a, a television commercial, uh, you may not need that disclosure because they know that, you know, there's an ad there. Um, but if they see, you know, their favorite, you know, celebrity on social media, you know, you know, taking a picture in their favorite, you know, brand of, you know, jeans, um, you know, are they, you know, is that person, you know, disclosing that and posting that because they really do like the product or are they receiving, you know, some type of, um, you know, is there a material connection with that, with that brand? So, um, so when in doubt, you know, make sure those, those disclosures are there. And I think the last thing to just make, uh, to take away, at least with the, uh, social media influencers is that it doesn't necessarily apply only to those kind of typical uh, influencers that, as we mentioned, may have, you know, made their career on social media and they're known as being an influencer, but, you know, any type of user generated con uh, content, if you're having, you know, consumers participate in a contest, um, those could still apply if there's a material connection. Um, so just to recap the basics as we went over, um, you know, with all these advertising and marketing claims, whether they're expressed or they're implied, you have to have the basics. They have to be true. They can't be misleading. Your claims have to be substantiated. And if there's any qualifications, disclaimers, those need to be clear and prominent. And these apply to all types of claims, whether it's about pricing, the materials, or the origin or source of the products. Um, and then as we uh, just mentioned with brands and influencers, you need to disclose those material connections if that connection is not obvious uh, from the context of the ad. Uh, next slide. And then some additional best uh, best practices. Um, if you're using an outside party um, for um, sending you know, marketing campaigns, sending your text messages, 
um, sending out promotion materials. Um, you should be monitoring and vetting, uh, vetting those service providers uh, and then also your service providers, service providers to make sure that there's compliance. Um, make sure you have compliant policies in place. Um, if you have any doubts, you know, it's, it's recommended seek advice of competent counsel if you have any questions. Um, for disclosures, it's important to train uh, your employees if you have a marketing department, but then also uh, any other employees who may be involved in these types of uh, marketing or advertising practices. Um, with regards to some of the uh, PCPA issues, uh, comply with any do not call registries um, and consider your marking list. This has been an issue we've seen in some cases where um, the company may purchase a marketing list and the, the content in that marketing list, whether it's contact information, emails, phone numbers, um, may not have consent from those individual users um, to, to receive those types of unsolicited commercial communication. So, um, you know, really vet those marketing lists um, and know where they're coming from and, um, you know, how they're being collected and whether it's proper consent. Uh, and then lastly, consider and revisit any opt-out processes you have that may be required by some of these rules and regulations. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and so with that, um, we definitely thank you all for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions about any of these materials, um, you can reach out to, to me or Tanya. Um, we also have a, a firm blog that discusses uh, consumer class action uh, issues. Uh, including some of these things you see here. So um, you can check out uh, that if you wanted to keep uh, stay up to date with some of the emerging and developing uh, uh, marketing consumer laws. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session of the City Care Small Business Academy. This presentation has been prepared by City Trends and Seifarth Shaw for informational purposes only. The material discussed during this webinar should not be construed as legal advice or a legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The content is intended for general information purposes only, and you are urged to consult a lawyer concerning your own situation and any specific legal questions you may have. Please leave any questions or feedback in the comments section below. For more helpful links and more episodes, please visit the CityCare Small Business Academy YouTube channel.